soldiers of the rising sun are little men, quick and wiry. Their uniforms are slovenly. Their faces, even in the heat of battle, are tawny masks, blank, expressionless. They believe that they have embarked upon a holy war, a war of liberation. It is senseless to seize an empire where wealth remains in the hands of the inhabitants. We must eliminate every element reluctant to cooperate with Japan. This also they firmly believe. And as the United Nations prepare to wipe out for all time the horror now spreading through the continent of Asia, they seek a closer knowledge of their savage enemy, the little men whose double faces and double minds may well render them the most dangerous foe of all. Through the clouds, the god Izanagi and the goddess Izanami looked down upon the sea. And out of the sea, they brought forth the eight great islands known as Dai Nippon, eight hardened crusts of earth floating upon the fires within the earth. Across the face of this land, the gods of Japan wrote their double character. From the smoking craters, they drew forth the spirits of storm and drought and earthquake. But in the valleys between, they spread the quiet loveliness of cherry blossom and chrysanthemum. And in this land, they set the Yamato race, seed of the sun and of Amaterasu, the sun goddess. Every member of this race is a member of a single divine family, bound to his ancestors, bound to the Supreme Father, whose figure he has probably never seen, or Tenshi-sama, the emperor, son of heaven, source of radiant peace. Before the shrines of the Shinto faith, the Japanese renews his devotion to the heads of the imperial house who have ruled him down the ages. Even in heaven, he is taught, the godlike ancestors practice deceit and treachery as well as good to achieve their divine ends. And he, their earthly child, must follow their example without question. To the Japanese, even the cherry blossom has a double meaning. Flower of spring, it is also the flower of the warrior samurai. For just as the cherry petals fall in full bloom, so it is the duty of the warrior to lay down his life in the prime of manhood. The samurai has learned to suppress every emotion behind a mask of self-control. Pain and hardship have conquered his spirit. He is one with the steel of his blade, aware of the enemy behind his back, aware of the moment to turn and strike. Yet, as if to compensate for the harsh self-denial imposed by his gods, the Japanese has clothed his daily life in a mantle of charm and poetry. This is the smiling face of a people to whom the design of an embroidery is as precious as the burning loyalty of their tribal faith, to whom the moves of three-dimensional chess are as deserving of study as the sweeping strokes of the warrior's sword. And so, frozen for 20 centuries in a feudal mold, the Yamato race lived on in this strange land, ruled by ghosts at once benevolent and cruel. And over them towered the snowy cone of Fujiyama, eternal mountain, source of the future splendor of Dai Nippon. 1867, the Emperor Meiji and a new Japan. A Japan with a veil of isolation swept back overnight. A Japan swiftly opening its gates to the flood tide of Western thought. Like a thirsty sponge, this new Japan sucked in the knowledge of the civilized world. Education from America, civil law from France, medicine from Germany, trading skill from Britain.
how the tribal spirit which had bound together the ancient clans served to build great modern business trusts. Gigantic combines like those of Mitsui and Mitsubishi wielding monopoly control in the name of a single family. Forsaking the shrines of their fathers, the Japanese people bowed before the altars of a new god, the almighty Yen, a deity whose symbol was the high collar and whose creed was competition. But behind the smoke of the great industrial cities, the old feudal system remained. The big plants, for all their new equipment, were but the stronghold of a modern medievalism. Their machine shops, air-conditioned dungeons, their 13 million workers, little more than serfs, sweating their hundred-hour weeks to the commercial glory of the great family trusts. A century ago, the Japanese shipwright who built a sampan large enough to cross the ocean was put to death by imperial decree. Fifty years later, his government was subsidizing him, and by 1937, he had placed his nation third on the world's list of merchant tonnage. Out into the ocean trade routes sailed this new merchant navy, sleek, modern ships moving down the broad blue bay of Tokyo, their holds stuffed with goods and gadgets to be dumped on markets overseas. And so the tin gods of the new Japan gazed upon the mountain of their destiny from the comfort of their easy chairs. And they said it was fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, that from peerless Fujiyama would arise a greater splendor for the island empire of Nai Nippon. But the reality was different, for all the bright lights in the movies were but another mask covering the true face of Japan. For those with eyes to see, the ancient demons of storm and lightning danced in the neon signs, and above the nightclubs hovered the spirits of tribe and priest and warrior, ghosts of the old Japan, stronger, deeper than the high-collar gods of the new. He emerged from the officers' clubs of Tokyo, Heideki Tojo, the razor brain, high priest of Japan's savage tribal past. No dust shall be cloud our return to the imperial road, and by dust I mean liberalism and the pursuit of personal desires. For years, the agents of the new faith had prepared the way. Through the state tourist bureau, they mobilized their spies on a scale which made even the Nazis look like amateurs. They equipped an army with notebook and camera and sent them forth to every land. And so the advance guards of the rising sun spread the rays of their divine mission across the earth. We are coming by the thousand. We are devoting every effort to the overseas development of our culture, the manifestation of the Japanese spirit among foreign peoples.